Okay, well, hello and welcome to Transparency with Zeb King. Our show is to interview various leaders and movers and shakers in the community. Uh, today we're lucky uh, and honored to have uh, Edith, Edith Loring Kahunga uh, yeah. interviewed uh, for our show today. Um, uh, and Edith wears a number of hats, and I, I've tried my best to, to get them all done, but we will see if I've got them. Uh, Edith is Executive Director for the Heliton, Heliton. Heliton Health Society, mm -hmm. which, as I understand it, provides a service to the Malhat, uh, Alalt, and uh, Luxon, Lyaxon, mm -hmm. First Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, as well, Edith is a, a, an elected school board trustee for the uh, Victoria School District. Yeah, for the Greater Victoria School Greater Board. Victoria, mm -hmm. yeah, Greater Victoria. Mm -hmm. And um, also a former candidate for the federal NDP in Saanich Gulf Islands. Right. Uh, I probably have missed some other hats that you wear <laughs> as well. That's good. And maybe we will get to that. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to get to know uh, you a bit more, Edith, and maybe the viewers as well can get to know your, you. Um, you're from the Wolf Clan of the Gitsan mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so I'm a member of the House of Gwinnanook, um, which is a house group within the Wolf Clan um, of the Gitsan Nation. So within the Gitsan Nation there are four clans, and each of those clans have house groups. And um, so I belong to the Wolf Clan, the Lakabu Clan is the way we say it, and, um, and the House of Gwinnanook, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and, and you have a Gitsan name yes, as well. Yeah. How do so, I say the Gitsan, your Gitsan yeah, name? Yeah, so my name, traditional name is Nuxgas, which is, means the, the mother of the chief. So oh. I, carry the, I carry the matriarch's name in our house group, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're uh, okay, so you have chiefs in, in your family. Yes, and, yeah. yeah. So my late mother was a chief and... Um, and now, after she passed away, then my eldest sister carries that name. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so the name actually imports, um, imparts certain rights and mm -hmm. uh, meaning as well. Well, and territory. And territory. Yeah, because, I mean, if um, the Gitsan Nation is actually comprised of 33,000 square miles, like a lot of people don't realize that, no, but... Didn't. It's sort of in the north central part of British Columbia, and, it, and our nation is quite diverse. And um, so, so, um, so yeah. So we have thirty three thousand square miles of our traditional territory, and um, my um, my late mother um, carried uh, the territory, which had two sort of two parts to it: the north and the south part. Um, and um, so. Yeah, so so along with the territory comes the names, um, mm -hmm. and your berry picking grounds, your fishing grounds, mm -hmm. your trapping grounds, like all of that is attached to that name, the songs, the history, mm -hmm. right? So so when you go to a feast um, and there's business that's conducted, all of that history is told mm -hmm. orally, and so what happens is that every chief then gets up and talks about how you've conducted business and whether they agree with the business that has taken place that mm. evening and and that so um, so yeah so it's very oral mm. and um, and it is our territory is very very diverse and very very vast a lot of people just don't realize that mm -hmm. the Gibson territory is so big mm -hmm. it, does the the um, the ceremony and I guess potlatches and mm -hmm. stuff happen every winter Maybe well, or? no, um, they generally are around, We most of our feasts today mm. are done around um, deaths, so when somebody oh. passes away, then a big potlatch is held, um, but if there's names that are given, or if there's settlements that have to happen, um, but it's, you know, it's not like the way that it was before, where it was marriages, right. and you know, uh, when there was wars and things like that. So now most of the feasts happen around when there's a death and then um, when that person passes away, then their name and their territory have to pass along. So whoever gets their name then would get the territory and the berry picking grounds and the fishing grounds, depend on, you know, what position they had within the house group or within the clan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you called back 
to that home occasionally to back to the Gitan territory yeah. to mm -hmm. also Be have to spend or to participate. And, yes, yeah. yeah, and especially because I have a fairly high name, mm -hmm. um, so I have a responsibility to keep that name alive and. And the way that you keep it alive is that it's brought up at feasts, right? So right. when you participate, your name is called out. And so, you know, so it's really important for you to keep it going, right? So, because if you're not in the feast hall and you're not practicing, then your name is slowly forgotten. Right. So the, the, the wealth of your name is really dependent upon how active you are as well within within um, the house as well, yeah. I think it's really important for all of us to think about how in, in addition to what we're probably going to go through in terms of all the hats you wear and stuff, mm -hmm. you've also got that responsibility back in the Gitsen territory and so mm -hmm. you, uh, that could keep you rather busy too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a little bit different like in Coast Salish territory, mm -hmm. people can carry like up to four people can carry a name one name okay. and but within our within our nation only one person has that name oh really yeah so so you yourself if you have that name you have the responsibility nobody else to keep that name going right so whereas down here um i've known yeah. many of the people who share the name like four people share one name um, so, you know, between the four of them, they can keep it active, whereas at home, oh. it's your responsibility to keep your name active. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are differences all over the uh, province with different First Nations and yeah. stuff. So mm -hmm. that's fascinating. Um, uh, so, so do you, do you get back to that area, to the mm -hmm. Gitsan area occasionally? Do you miss it uh, now and then? Yeah, I think as I get older, yeah. you know, um, but I, I try to go home, you know, at least three, preferably four times a year. So I go home every year to do my fish. I try to go okay. home every year to do our salmon. Once you've tried Skeena River salmon, it's huh. very difficult to get used to other salmon. So I try to go home every year to do my salmon. Um, I also, go, we go home and hunt every year. Um, and we've done it for over 40 years. All of our family get together and we go hunting together. Wow. Um, and then of course for a feast and whatever. So I try to get home at least three to four times a year. Mm -hmm. Is the fishing in the river uh, net fishing or is it? Is um, no, net. Um, uh, like guys. With in behind a boat, right? Okay. We yeah. set the net and and um, and then in parts of our territory, you can also do gaffing. Okay. So or dip netting as yep. well. Dip so, netting, yep. but the canyon is very steep, right? So, so we tend to go on the river more than out there in the canyon because if you're doing canyon fishing, you need at least a ninety foot uh, dip net. Yeah, it's pretty wow. deep. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. impressive. Yeah, um, so with the, uh, uh, I'm curious about uh, discussing just a little bit about language. Mm -hmm. uh, is the Gitan language um, Gitan? Yeah, Gitanama. Gitanama. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, so it's um, you know like uh, if I you know I try to compare to what's happening down in the south mm -hmm. here. Um, Sanchothan was a language that was, you know, almost coming to an extinction, right? Yeah. And they really worked hard, and I think in the last 10 years on revitalizing it. And at home, a lot of my, my people my age still speak the language. So when you go into the feast hall, it's all Gitsanama. Very little English. I mean, if they feel there's enough people in there that don't understand, they might translate. But generally, all of the business is still done in Gipsanama. That's really mm -hmm. remarkable. I, mm -hmm. I, I was lucky as a kid to learn a bit of Kwakwala in Alert oh. Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think um, you knew my grandfather, too, who, who, who spent some time um, uh, teaching at UVic. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we have a connection that way. Yes, Dr. Well. Richard King. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> he was an amazing man for oh, Aboriginal students and mm -hmm. First Nation studies yeah. in, in, at UVic. Good role model for me. I I found, um, mm -hmm. and I was, uh, you know, I was uh, um, had the opportunity to take a couple of his classes oh, as good. well. So, you know, and spent some time with him because, you know, one of the things about Dr. King was Aboriginal students didn't really have a place at UVic, right. and um, so he had this big office, and part of it was his library, and so he gave half of his office oh, is that um, and dedicated it to to the library, to, to an area where people could come and have tea or, mm -hmm. you know, students could come and exchange um, 
items or, or, you know, to collect food for one another and stuff, right? But it was his office, and his office was divided in half, and we, as students, got one side, and he got the other side. <laughs> so <laughs> always remember Dr. Oh, King. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's, uh, language is already, uh, you know, there are a fair number of people that speak it still, in mm -hmm. anima, in, uh, in that territory and uh, probably some efforts to keep it alive as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, you know, uh, for many years, my home reserve, uh, Gitlaga, um, actually ran an immersion school for many years. And then, of course, politics took over and everybody felt that, you know, we shouldn't be focusing on Gitsanima, but we should go on English. So that mm -hmm. happened in the n 1990s and early 2000s, the school actually um, got shut down. And it really? Went, well, it didn't get shut down, it just moved to English. Oh. And now they're trying to revitalize it again, yeah. but all of that work that went into developing the curriculum, and we had qualified teachers that were, wow. that were, um, spoke Gitsan fluently, and could teach in the school, wow. and, it, and they were developing the curriculum from scratch, like just based on what was happening out in the territory. And um, so there was a lot of effort, and I had the privilege of working in the school, and there was a lot of effort put into, into the curriculum, and, and that, um, but unfortunately then the politics changed and people just didn't feel that it was the way to go. And now when I go back there and I see how much effort is, tr is put back in trying to bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, from what I've experienced since I've had, um, I think uh, immersion really is the way to go if it's possible mm -hmm. to do. It sounds like it might be possible if the politics can come along yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, speaking of the politics, uh, Edith, you're, you're really, uh, you have all the education credentials. I, mm -hmm. I think you have the Bachelor of Arts in Education, um, or is it ba Bachelor of Education? Bachelor of Education mm -hmm. is called, and then a Master's in Education Leadership as yeah. well, mm -hmm. which uh, makes you very qualified, I think, mm -hmm. to, to be in that area, and mm -hmm. you're a school board trustee. Yeah. Um, the, is it your second term? Did I get that right? Or? Yeah, well I spent, I had one term in Saanich, um, okay, so, right. so I ran in Saanich in 2008 mm -hmm. and so I was uh, the very first First Nations person to ever be elected to Saanich School Board. Mm -hmm. And so my term was 2008 to 2011. Okay. That's in May when I ran for the federal NDP for the Saanich Gulf Islands. And then in November of that year, because the federal election was in May 2011, and so I lost that election and it was kind of like, do I really want to stay involved in politics? Because you know what? It's tough. It's yeah. tough. It's... Um, I was just speaking yesterday on a panel um, with women in politics with Carol James and mm -hmm. Jean Crowder and myself and, oh, okay. and the mayor from Port McNeil. Uh -huh. And, you know, I said, you know, that um, the 2011 election, even though there was three women on mm -hmm. that were running, that were candidates and, and one male, it was a tough election. It in was really way? tough. Like, just... Um, you know the dirtiness that can happen and mm -hmm. and stuff. So so I felt really traumatized when I left the election, um, and so I thought I don't want to, you know, get involved again, right, in politics, right. But then my husband was like, you know, like I told you that when you get involved in politics, you gotta grow thick, get thick yeah. skin, um, and so anyway. Um, then I had a few people try to convince me to go in and run in Victoria, in the Greater Victoria School Board, um, which was a larger school board, and and uh, I think people felt that maybe that would give me another stepping stone to maybe getting back involved in provincial or federal, right? And so, so I finally agreed to run in uh, for the Greater Victoria School Board, and that was in November 2011. So I got elected, and then I was re-elected in 2014. Okay. So I'm serving my second term um, with in Greater Victoria. Victoria. But yeah. you've been a school board trustee three so, terms. Yeah. yeah, so eight years so far. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. well, so yeah. a seasoned politician. I don't know if you're seasoned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty hard.
hard to be seasoned. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, there's always something new. Oh, there's always something new. <laughs> yeah. And um, so uh, when I looked at the, the, the website, I think for the school board, I was, I was looking at it. I think it said that you're the chairperson. Yes. Uh, you're currently the chairperson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if that uh, changed or not. Uh, there's... No. no, so so, yeah. so um, our election happens in December of every year, November, December. Okay. For the chair, and so the first year, it was a battle, right? Oh. I mean, there was three of us that ran Four. out of nine, yeah. Okay. And then, so I was elected, and then the second year I was acclaimed. Oh, okay. So nobody ran against me, and so so I got acclaimed. So this is my second year. And the the reputation, and uh, I, you can clarify if this is correct, is that uh, you have a different style uh, of chairing. Is that fair? I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I I would hope so. Um, we had a very divided board, right? Huh. And um, we had f uh, four on one side and four on the other side, and myself. And um, so. So it was, it was very difficult to come to the table and to, um, to try to make decisions on behalf of what's best for the kids. Because everybody, as you know, being elected, and you know, everybody has their own agenda, right? When they get to the table and they've, you know, decided to run for for usually specific reasons, right? They want to make a change at whatever it is. Um, and so when you have a divided board, it's very difficult to try to get people to come together. And, um, and so my first year, you know, um, being elected at, in the Greater Victoria School Board, and I tell people this, that um, I went home and cried almost every night after every board meeting. Mm -hmm. Like it was so brutal. And not the public meetings, because you have to get come out of the in-camera and smile and pretend nothing happened in the in-camera, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was the in-camera, right, that mm -hmm. um, was really difficult in the comments and different things that happened mm -hmm. in the in-camera. And then you've got to come out and put this face on, like you're all working together and you're all... Mm -hmm you know, there for the kids. Um, so, so I think the first year was really tough for me. And, but again, it was kind of trying to just remember um, why I'm there and mm -hmm. right, why, why did I decide to, um, to get elected and, and why what was is my it? purpose? Why are you there? I think I wanted to bring a voice for um, children that didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so whether that's First Nations, or whether that's uh, people with dis students with disabilities or students with special needs, um, you know, uh, minority groups, mm -hmm. but just wanted to make sure there was a voice at the table for them. And do you bring so, that in, in that different way of chairing? I do think you, so. Yeah. I think the other thing about the chairing mm -hmm. is, um, is allowing everybody to have a voice. Right? Like, because the chair could be pretty mm -hmm. brutal, right? And cut people off. But I have a style that has been like, no, oh, let, let people have the opportunity to express themselves. Because if they don't at the board table, they're going to when they right. walk out of the boardroom, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so you might as well give people the opportunity to express themselves and say how they feel. And, and so um, Robert's Rules of Order mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily give you that that uh, freedom to do that. And so, right. so you know, so I lax the rules a little mm -hmm. bit in the sense of, you know, allowing everybody to have equal voice at the table. And if they wanted to ask more than one question, that was fine. And um, until we got kind of developed um, a respectful, I think, uh, atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would always say to, to, the, to the trustees was, we can always disagree. I don't have a problem with that, but let's be respectful towards one another, right? And I think that's the the atmosphere that I was really trying to convey, right? So, and I, in the first three months that I was chair, every single meeting I'd start off with, let's not get personal, let's stick to the issues. You want to speak to the issues? Great. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get personal, I will not tolerate it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and no underhanded comments, right? Like, let's just, if we're going to debate, let's debate mm -hmm. the issues. So I think that that, just reminding people of that for the first three months, and then I never had to do it again. And now it works 
Well, um, you know what? Back. I think we've had a slip back. Okay. Yeah, and so um, so at the last meeting, our first meeting in this school year, um, I reminded trustees that was, you know, my very first meeting back in September, and I had to remind tr trustees like, I'm not allowing personal attacks, mm -hmm. um, or you know. Um, accusations or innuendo you know, and yeah stuff. like yeah. you know let's stick to the issue sure if you want to speak to the issue great mm. um so so i think you That's know it's tough I, in this day and age when we see certain politicians on the television acting <laughs> in bad ways it's so good for you for trying to get that going yeah. yeah so i think so that and then i think that the other big issue big thing that really helped us as a board was we finally got a strategic plan oh. and so we can actually you know and, and i said this to um to our um all of our principals and our senior leadership team once we got the the strategic plan and it was the first time i believe in august when we met as a group I felt like we're all in the same canoe and we're all actually paddling in the same direction, which was huge. I've been on the board now for mm -hmm. five years and finally I feel like we're all, you know, we're all paddling mm -hmm. in the same direction and, you know, when you have nine people that are steering in different directions, it's mm -hmm. very difficult, but I feel like, okay, finally we're, we're agreeing to come together for the benefit of the kids and do the best that we can for the kids and we've got a lot of work to do so right you know yeah i imagine there's a lot that goes on at the school board level there's a lot that goes on at the municipal council level so and mm. it's it's uh meetings every week of course yeah. so yeah. yeah we deal with a lot um uh, and you it, know we have almost nine well over nineteen thousand students 19, right um and we have 47 schools wow 47 schools. yeah That's you know so close to five thousand staff sure Right? So, I mean, you know, we're one of the bigger employers. I mean, we have a, you know, $220 million budget. Is being a school board trustee all that you thought it would be? Or is it quite different than you thought it would be? No, I, I think it's, um, you know, when I first got elected, I didn't realize how much work it would be. Mm -hmm. If you want to be active and you want to be, um, make a difference, then, you know, you have to put a lot of work mm -hmm. into it. So I probably spend about 20 hours a week. Are the meetings webcasted for the uh, public? The board meeting is. Oh, oh they are. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. yeah. I know that's increasingly a thing for municipal councils too, so the public can, can watch. Uh, it's a little different than just reading the minutes, of course. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see uh, yeah. what was discussed and stuff. So. And see people's reactions. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not always caught in the minutes. <laughs> um, so, I think there might be some question about the funding model that the province uses. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, myself, I've uh, recently been bringing up in this school uh, district area of 63, mm -hmm. um, some question about uh, uh, the need for the province to properly fund schools. Yeah. Uh, I've read uh, that uh, I think it was as recently as May of 20, 2016, your board sent a letter to Minister Bernier seeking greater help with funding for public schools in your district. So, well, one of the big things with the new BC Ed curriculum is so much of it is based on technology, right? I mean, there's a lot of technology that is used, and so, so one of our biggest challenges was making sure that technology was available for teachers and for staff. So this year, we committed to spending almost $2 million in technology with the idea that every teacher, um, every um, teacher would have access to a mobile device. So we have laptops in all of the classrooms. Um, mm. And that was huge, right? Because, um, so that was not funded. That was, that was, we were expected to take that out of our regular budget. Um, so that's one area. The other area is courses, um, uh, support for teachers and making sure that they're trained to be able to use the new curriculum. The new curriculum is very different, right? I mean, the old curriculum, if you took a look at the old curriculum, every subject had learning objectives. Some of those subjects 
would have 80 to 100 learning objectives. So it was very prescribed. Mm -hmm. The new BCN curriculum is wide open. It's based on competencies and it's much more mm -hmm. open and much more flexible. And so mm -hmm. teachers don't have that prescribed curriculum. So it's almost relearning. I think a lot, a lot of teachers have uh, had been doing some of that already, but right. um, but then you know, so it's giving them the training that they need to be able to do the job that the government is now expecting them all to do. So, so those were two big issues for us. So that was just a couple of areas that we felt that the government, even though they're implementing this new BC Ed curriculum, no no extra dollars attached to it, and yet school districts are expected to to cover those costs. Well, we've been very fortunate enough that um, with our school board that we've been able to, we've had some financial resources available to us, but there are many school districts like Saanich that have really been strapped for extra cash. And so, um, you know, so as we continue to use that bit of extra cash that we have, then we don't have the funding to do other things either, right? So one of the other big issues that we're faced with this year is, of course, is the, is our water, right? All of our drinking fountains that had to be mm. updated and um, due to lead pipes, or yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and even the wear and tear on some of our schools, yeah. right? You know, the seismic upgrades, yes, those are being done, um, but what about the schools that don't necessarily have? Uh, to go ahead with the seismic upgrades and don't have the priority. And so, you know, one of our schools that is really uh, needs a lot of work. Um, so, so we're saying, okay, well, now we're taking this $2 million out of our regular budget that could probably be used somewhere else right. if the government fully funded the new BC Ed curriculum. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, well, that gets to the, the point I was um, thinking of in terms of uh, these are assets that are in the jurisdiction of the province mm -hmm. and are they properly funding and uh, properly maintaining schools and seeing that as their responsibility of course their responsibility the tax dollars come from all of us yeah um, but uh, just thinking in terms of um, uh, to, I guess to some degree it's the school board's responsibility to manage it, mm -hmm. provided funding from the province, but uh, it, it really is a responsibility of the province to, to fund. And well, to, to fully fund to public fully fund. education, right? I mean, you know, and that's the issue. Like for me, that was one of the big issues why I decided to get involved with, uh, as to get elected. Um, funding and fully funding public education is very different. And I think that the, the one big item that we have to remember is public education is the basis for democracy in our country. And so if we don't have our schools fully funded, then is that is that our is our democracy at risk then? Right. right? So that's a huge thing for me. So um, we know that the funding formula is long overdue. Like it needs to be, um, you know, uh, needs to be really looked at and changed because it's not working. Um, so if you look, take a look at how many how many school boards or how many school districts in BC are struggling to to right. try to create a balanced budget. Um, there are many of them, and um, and it's because the funding form is so out of date. It needs to be changed. So you have so many more downloaded costs that we didn't have before, right? Teachers' pensions, um, MSP premiums. I mean, the list goes on. BC Hydro costs, right? Well, the funding formula has not changed, and yet all of those costs have continued to increase. And the, some of those things were not even our responsibility at one time, but now we're expected to pay for it out of our school budget. So, so. So when you take a look at the funding formula that was created 20, 30 years ago, it's way out of date. It needs to be changed completely so that it meets the needs that we currently have in order to fully fund public education and to keep it at the stand that we all, all agree that public education is a good education in Canada and BC. And if we're going to keep it at that and make sure that our kids are doing well, um, then we need to fund it properly. 
Thank you for mentioning that and, and also the, the provincial context. I was at the Union of BC Municipalities Convention mm -hmm. uh, recently where this topic was uh, one that came up mm -hmm. uh, for municipalities and, and school boards, but uh, many municipalities worried about their schools mm -hmm. and um, wanting that support from the province. It seems that uh, the province to some degree is um, uh, needs to step up and, and, and fund the public schools uh, and of course students don't necessarily vote yet mm -hmm. so is that part that may be why the emphasis mm -hmm. isn't placed on on schools uh, and we're facing an election coming up who, who knows mm -hmm. what the reason is but uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of concern around the province in many many communities mm -hmm. about this issue yeah. yeah, and you know, and so like this year, you, you take a look at the summer, the summer. We always get these announcements during the summer, right, from the Ministry mm -hmm. of Education. And this summer was no different than any other summer. Um, so we got increase of funding for transportation. And of course, that doesn't really apply too much to our school district. Um, for small schools. Why is that? It doesn't schools. apply to your school? Well, because we don't, we don't run a lot of transportation. Oh, We're not okay. considered rural enough to... Mm -hmm to have that. Um, so um, so we got all of these little pieces of money of how much, you know, uh, if it was $20 million, how did it float out to all of us as, as school districts? And so, you know, I think, well, why not just take a look, like instead of giving us all these little pots of money um, as we go through to the next, to the, each school year, why not just reallocate and refigure that entire block funding and and add it in there all at once instead of you know waiting for school boards to we have to pal pass a balanced budget in June and then we get all of these little trickles of money over the summer doesn't really make sense mm -hmm. why not give us some money ahead of time before we have to do a balanced budget and do all of these cutbacks but like I said we're fortunate in Victoria that we haven't had to do too many cutbacks um, and but we certainly will be if we carry on the way that we're going and we're having to continue to um, eat costs that the government really should be paying for. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to completely leave the education topic uh, before we talk a little bit about uh, Aboriginal students mm -hmm. and, uh, and any efforts that have been made to, uh, especially with the... Um, uh, or planned with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's recommendations and uh, mm -hmm. and some of those uh, in terms of um, the curriculum and uh, what teachers can do and mm -hmm. uh, what is going on in that regard? Well, as you know, um, Aboriginal stu students still are not graduating at the same rate that non-Aboriginal students are. There's probably, you know, the figure in in provincially is, you know, in the 50s, right, and most students graduate at a higher rate. So so the minister keeps on saying that they're trying to address it, right? Um, and um, and it, so it makes it really difficult. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do in the Greater Victoria School Board is develop a relationship, a, a closer relationship with the local First Nations. Um, we've really um, taken a look at our grad rates, kind of tried to dissect it and make some sense of it. And we found that, uh, and this research is in the last six months or so, that we found that um, Aboriginal students who are off reserve tend to graduate at a higher rate than those that are on reserve. So we started to ask the question, why? What, what is happening? Um, and that's where our conversation is right now, and we realize that we need to be really um, having those kinds of conversations with the First Nations and, and trying to figure out um, how do we increase that rate. Um, some of the research that we've done, that our superintendent has done, um, is taking a look at, there seems to be a real correlation between attendance in primary school mm -hmm. and graduation rates. Mm -hmm. So if you have if you're a student that uh, is missing a lot of school, grade three, grade four, that's probably a good indication of whether or not you're going to graduate. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so, so we're hoping that we can have some of those conversations and if kids aren't at school, then they're probably not going to be able to graduate. And um, to have those conversations, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so I had a motion put forward um, that invited the two local First Nations to the table, to the board table, to be considered um, a partner group. Right now we have parents at the table and we have our union, um, our three union groups that are at the table. But we don't have uh, the two QPs and uh, are actually four uh, groups at the tables for the four employee groups and the parents. But we don't have First Nations at the table. So my motion got passed last uh, May and um, to have them and to be included as partners. So that motion was passed and they have attended some of the meetings um, so that they would not only they have a spot at the committee table as well as a board table. And um, so we're still kind of, because that was new, June was our first meeting where, the, where they were included. And so now we're hoping to have much more of those detailed conversations. And the reason why I didn't really just want them at, um, at the committee table and not have a, a formal spot at the board table and the committee table was because if we have just a committee with Aboriginal students discussing Aboriginal issues and about Aboriginal students, I don't feel that the rest of the district gets the benefit mm. of having them at the table talking about all sure. students, right? We learn together. Yeah, yeah. like it's so that it's not just, oh, well, if you're Aboriginal, you're right. over on the Aboriginal right. committee. Yeah. Well, no, um, you have a lot to share that could be shared with mm -hmm. the entire district. And so for me, that was one of the reasons why I felt that it was important for them to be formally, have a formal spot at our committee table and our board table. Even myself as an Aboriginal woman, a First Nations woman, I feel like I have a lot to offer all students, not just Aboriginal students. Sure. Right? No, this, much of what you've said mm -hmm. seems like it would benefit everybody. Yeah. So um, I uh, was going to touch on yet another hat that you wear, um, and that was the one with the Haliton. The Leighton Health Aleaton. Society. Mm -hmm. Health Society. You're the executive director. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know a lot about the Health Society, but uh, are they, uh, where are they located? So we have two health centers that oh, we okay. operate. Yeah. Uh, one in Malahat and oh, one yeah. in Halalt, oh, on yeah. Halalt Reserve. Um, and so I manage all of the health services for, the, for those three bands. So oh. we have everything from physicians, nurse practitioners, RNs, um, home and community care, we have a dentist, a dental hygienist. Uh, they're not all full-time, right? They're, some come in a day, uh, a week, a day, a month, half a day every uh, week, but... Um, I, read, I read that you uh, champion the uh, role of culture. Yes. And, mm -hmm. um, and well, wellness programming mm -hmm. in, into the community, or into the the work of the, the society. Yeah. Well, when, when I first went there, I've been there a little over two years now, um, and the community really wanted to see more culture. They felt that it was a very clinical place, and it was very health-driven. Um, How do you do that, being from another um, First Nation, uh, from Gitsan area? It's not me. No. It's just, I'm just the vehicle, right? right? right. And um, so it's identifying the elders in the community, uh -huh. right? And having the community identify them um, and our board and our staff that mm -hmm. identify them. And so we started off with elders and residents mm -hmm. and the elders and residents um, basically identified other elders and we established an elders advisory circle and they meet every two weeks and they guide the work, right? Mm -hmm. They basically... Um, tell me what I need to do and the staff, right? And they guide and they tell us what's a proper protocol, mm -hmm. what's not. Um, and so from that, they decided that they, um, you know, many of our youth are really struggling um, in the community like any other community. And so um, they decided that they really wanted to bring back sort of an honoring for adolescents and so through my conversations with them, we decided to bring what we call the coming of age, which is a puberty rights ceremony back to the community, which hadn't been done in 
one of our elders is in his late 70s and he was probably one of the few that remembers that going through that ceremony wow. and so so we brought the coming of age we just had it again in September so our second one wow. um, where all of the boys and girls from ages 10 to 13 participate in a cultural ceremony um, and so so essentially so, it's been dormant for a long yeah. time and mm -hmm. it's come back uh, yeah, Fantastic. so so we've done that. Um, we've also done um, honoring our babies ceremony, mm -hmm. and wow. so which is to there's a high rate, as everybody knows, of Aboriginal children being apprehended and put in foster wow. care, and so one of the things that they the elders really wanted to do was to bring back the extended family responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if you're having trouble, then somebody else in the family should be able to step forward and help you with you know, raising your children or supporting you, right, when you're going through difficult times. So we brought back the Honoring Our Baby Ceremony, and that's uh, where um, parents identify other par uh, people that want to be act like kind of like godparents, and they enter into a partnership agreement. And so that whole ceremony took place. And so we run that in March, and so the second one will be coming up. So those are really huge things for in terms of bringing culture back. We also were running um, language classes once a week as well, um, and we so we have the elders in residence. Um, we also did a traditional medicines um, that just finished up last week, uh, where um, somebody from the community. Uh, taught other people in the community how what kind of medicines like if you have like how to make cough syrup how to make different kinds of salves um, and right out right in behind our health center everything pretty well everything you wanted for cures natural cures was right in behind our health center wow. um, and so she spent the whole um, the last um, eight months just teaching people about all of the different medicines that are there, how to, how to actually um, make tinnitures and, and turn them into medicines and use them, right? So, um, so that's another one. And also art and play therapy. We've, um, so it's not just art and play, but we incorporate culture in it. So kids that are really struggling, part of the culture was the water and how important that water is. And so we ran, we run paddling programs for the youth in the summer. We start off in the spring and run them right up until September. Um, we do nature walks. We incorporate a lot of the um, Aboriginal art within, within the art and play. So just trying to weave, and that was the, our mission statement when we went through the whole process of the strategic plan, um, was weaving tradition and culture with modern health day practices. Mm -hmm. And so that was the message that I was given. That was my mission to fulfill. And so I just look for those opportunities and because I've got, had the experience of doing it and I'm comfortable with doing it, um, there are some challenges because there's proper protocol that you have to follow. You have to be very careful that you're not offending anybody mm -hmm. or you're not doing anything that you shouldn't be doing. Um, and that's the blessings of the elders, right? Because they kind of guide that work. And so I'm just kind of like the vehicle that mm -hmm. makes sure that there's funding available there and, and that, um, that the resources are there that it could be carried out, basically. Mm -hmm. well, well, Edith, I want to uh, thank you for sharing that and for being a leader in our community. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very obvious that what you're doing is so important. Uh, I just can see him. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm.